I just finished up a uh, panel discussion for the Schieffer series on what's going on in Egypt, a fascinating discussion, lasted an hour with uh, several people with different perspectives on what's happening. Some people optimistic, some more pessimistic. For the whole video, you can watch it here now. Thanks. Good evening. Good evening. Can I ask everybody to take their seats, please? Good evening. Uh, good evening and welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, my name is Andrew Schwartz. I'm Senior Vice President for External Relations here. Uh, welcome to everybody coming out, uh, especially on such short notice. This is usually we put the Sheeper series together a little bit further in advance, but this the, the dramatic events that we've all been glued to in Egypt over the last uh, several days uh, really made this an important session to have, and I'm so glad uh, you all could make it out here. And I think this is the first Sheeper series we've done since the Horn Frogs won the Rose Bowl. And Bob got his. <laughs> So we'd, we'd say go frogs to all our frozen friends actually back in Fort Worth who are suffering what we normally suffer. Um, I'd also like to thank United Technologies, our sponsor of this series that's made it possible uh, for us to have these wonderful sessions led by the one and only Bob Schieffer. Bob. Thank you very much and thank, thanks to all of you for coming. I mean, we do try to stay on top of the news. I remember the last uh, one of these we had, it was uh, right after the North Korean thing erupted and we were the day of. Uh, when, when we uh, did our thing on uh, North Korea and their uh, potential uh, nuclear power. We're going to talk about Egypt today, and we really have uh, some great uh, folks. Uh, Dr. Ebrahim uh, Fukara uh, is Bureau Chief for Al Jazeera Satellite Channel uh, and the D.C. and New York offices. Uh, he's a host of uh, From Washington, a weekly show on American issues. Uh, and current affairs and how they impact uh, U.S. relations with the Arab and Muslim worlds. Uh, he came to uh, Al Jazeera uh, uh, eight years ago from the D.C.-based AllAfrica.com, one of the world's largest providers of African news and analysis. Before that, uh, he was uh, with the BBC and uh, also The World, a Boston-based uh, co-production of the, of the BBC. Uh, Nancy Youssef, uh, my friend uh, from McClatchy, uh, was for a long time the bureau chief in uh, Baghdad, I guess, and then in Afghanistan, too. Uh, most of her reporting in recent years uh, has been about Baghdad and, uh, Baghdad and uh, Iraq and, and Afghanistan, but she is Egyptian. Uh, both of her parents are Egyptian. Uh, they live here now, but uh, she has a lot of family in Cairo, so she can uh, tell us exactly what's happening over there from not from the standpoint of the government of the demonstrators, but uh, folks uh, who live there. And then John Alterman, of course, uh, is director, senior fellow of the Middle East programs here at CSIS. Uh, prior to that, a uh, member of the policy planning staff of the U.S. Department of State, special assistant to uh, Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs, a member of the Chief of Naval Operations Executive Panel. Before that, of course, he, he was an academic. Uh, he taught uh, Johns Hopkins and also at uh, George Washington, a scholar at the U.S. Institute of Peace and at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. So we got uh, some folks here, as we always do, who have a pretty good, uh, pretty good experience on what they come here to talk about. So uh, let me just start, and I'm going to ask just this one general question to all three of you. And, uh, Dr. Pokara, you can, we'll just go around the horn here. Is this a revolt or is it a revolution? Oh boy. <laughs> I'm going to relax and think. <laughs> I think it's a revolution to the extent that it may succeed. I think if it does succeed and it passes off peacefully, and leads to a good outcome uh, for Egypt, for the Arab uh, region, and for the relations between the Arab region and the West, particularly the United States. I think it'll be revolutionary in its implications, transforming the region, something that some US administrations have tried to do in that part of the world and sometimes dismally failed um, it would be revolutionary in the sense that if it happens relatively peacefully, because we've seen some violence over the last 24 hours, but if it happens peacefully, it will be food for thought, not just for Egyptians, 
but for other Arabs about how they can transform themselves without necessarily going back to where the Arab wo world was just two months ago before Tunisia happened. And Nancy Youssef, uh, you, you were on the phone with friends, relations uh, all day today. What do they think? Well, they don't know. And, I, and to step back a bit, the reason this is such a critical question is what we're really asking is what's an acceptable outcome to the Egyptians. If the acceptable outcome is Omar Suleiman, is um, members of the current government, um, the status quo in terms of the institutions of government and how it's set up, then it's a revolt. It's a revolt against Mubarak and some of the practices of his government. If there's a fundamental change in how things are done in Egypt and, and presumably in the Middle East broadly, then this becomes a revolution. To, to, to your question about what people are saying, you know, I'm talking to the people mostly who aren't in Tahir Square right now, um, who are hunkered down in their homes, who are protecting their neighborhoods in some cases, who are um, trying to stretch their, their Egyptian pounds as far as possible as they don't know when they're going to get to the bank next. And, and they're middle class um, Egyptians that I'm talking to. And by and large, I hear them saying, look, we don't want Mubarak. We hear it. But this idea of an immediate uh, end of his regime, what next? It's the uncertainty that, 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 that worries them. You know, it's the devil you know versus the one you don't. On top of that, they're seeing a revol the, the, the protests in the street, and they don't know who those people are who, and who they're speaking on behalf of. And so I think, in a way, they feel like their, their needs, their demands, their, their needs and wants are being hijacked by these two um, polling forces, the, the, the more Bubaric regime and those who want, who want the revolution. And I think they, in a lot of ways, feel, feel stuck in the middle. Um, I call every day, uh, and I call to various parts of Cairo. And today I called into Ma'adi, which those of you who know Cairo is very near where all this is happening. And uh, I got the funniest comment I've heard the whole time. I, uh, my, if, you, if you're Egyptian, then you know you're related to people and you don't know how. So I'm going to say my cousin's wife <laughs> um, said, you know, you know, when you guys had your Monica Lewinsky scandal, you had months to investigate the president. How can we have to form a new government tomorrow? <laughs> so that was their analogy today. <laughs> John, who, are the, who do you think these people are, just picking up on what, what Nancy is saying well, here? You know, they don't really know who they are. There, there are a lot of different people who've never been put together before. And, and when they've tried to come together, it hasn't really worked. Uh, the Kafaya movement was trying several years ago to, to create a broad-based uh, coalition, never really succeeded. So I think what you have is, is you have a group that is largely agreed on basically a negative proposition, that is, the president must leave. It's hard to agree on a positive proposition, what they want as an alternative. The president and the government have been very careful not to allow people to formulate an alternative. So the alternative is the government or chaos. And one of the words you will see over and over and over when, the pre when President Mubarak talks is the word chaos, and he is the alternative to chaos. Now, as to your question as to whether this is a revolt or a revolution, I think it's interesting to remember that when Egypt had a coup in 1952 led by the army, the army has been in power since, it wasn't initially called a revolution. It was originally a Harak al mubaraka the Blessed Movement. And it didn't become, it didn't have the name revolution until time had passed and people wanted to define it as such. And I think whatever happens, again, we're in a period where we don't know what it is quite yet. What it is is likely to be tremendously significant, but it's very early to say that this is a revolution because it's very early to judge the direction of the impact. In fact, rather than, than turning things over, it may create a consolidation much more of the status quo than anybody had anticipated uh, even a week ago. Um, Hosni Mubarak gave an interview today, and I might as well say who he gave it to, my <laughs> competitor, Christian Amanpour. Uh, and he said, uh, he's tired of serving. He said, I'm fed up with it. I've been doing this 62 years which is a pretty good run when you stop and think about it. Uh, and he said he wants to quit, but he says he can't because it would be chaos if he quit. Do you think, uh, Doctor, that that's what would happen? Is it, is it Mubarak or chaos? Well, I mean, just to put it in a, in a, in a philosophical context, it, it obviously has something to do with, with power. Power obviously does something to human beings. 
And for me, as a, an Arab living in this country, where obviously there's a constitution which reflects the foresight of the founding fathers, it's a very interesting question that you're raising because those guys, when you know they uh, wrote the constitution, they obviously foresaw this. Power is addictive, and unless you have a strong enough incentive to leave it, you will not leave it. There's a joke doing the rounds in the Arab world, some of you Americans may have heard it, which is uh, one of uh, Mubarak's aides went to him and he said, Mr. President, the people are clamoring for a farewell speech. And he said, farewell speech? Why? Where are they going? <laughs> and, and, and I, and I, and I, and I, th I think it, it. I think it just sums up the relationship that mankind, throughout his his or her history, has had to uh, to uh, power. Now, the specific case of what he actually said, I find it very interesting that he has gone on the record as saying that after the going got tough, if he'd chosen to say it maybe a week ago you and I would not be, you probably would not have, have raised that, mm -hmm. that, that issue. So I, I, I think he's, he's, he's probably, the last week has probably taken a very strong toll on him, but I still find the, 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 uh, the, the statement a little bit disingenuous in the sense that all politicians can be disingenuous. Uh, John, uh, you and I, you and I were, uh, talking uh, before we came in here. Uh, what do you see happening now? Because clearly these counter demonstrators seem to be, uh, at least if not all of them, uh, most of them, it would seem, appear to be sent there by the government. Or do we know that? I mean, certainly we, that's the way it looks from the outside. We don't know it. There certainly seem to be ties of some of the demonstrators to the government. Certainly people would know that the government would approve. Some people seem to work for government businesses. I think there, there's also some basic support for the leader among many of, the, many of these people, even if they don't have to be told, is a sense will be viewed with approval by people near them. But, but my sense of what's happening and Nancy and I uh, sort of hit on this together as we were talking yesterday afternoon and our, our mood started to sink, is that the, the government seems to be positioning itself so that rather than being the object of the demonstrations, it's the broker between these people who are starting to use violence and the protesters. So what the government says is we're not, we're, we're going to hold back the mob and we will make sure that the mob of the protesters doesn't take over either. And we've heard the protests. We've heard the young people, Omar Suleiman this afternoon, said, thank you for raising these issues and alerting us, and we're aware. And we'll work with you to resolve the difference between this mob who is using violence against peaceful protesters and the peaceful protesters. That puts the government holding two out of three of the chairs which is, I think is precisely where the government wants to be. And then the government will manage this process through Omar Suleiman, through the prime minister, with the support of the president, with the presumed support of the military. And rather than leading to a real opening of the political process, it ends up being continuation of the political process with, I think, two important reservations. One is perhaps the government feels it was too lax allowing the political organization to, to go on, so you have more controls on, on communications, on, on the internet, on political activity than they had leading up to this. And a retreat from the sort of economics that were intended to bring in foreign investment to make it a better investment climate in Egypt and a return to the socialist inspired economics of subsidies and state capitalism. So in the longer term, what you're going toward is not an Egypt that moves forward into more open and prosperous economic future, but instead in Egypt that looks much more like Egypt in 1995 than Egypt that people thought we were going toward in 2015. Do you, do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, it was interesting. Suleiman, thank you for bringing up the cons you didn't know before all this happened. I mean, of course they knew. And, 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 and frankly, I think it's working because there are very real practical things that are happening to everyday Egyptians who are hunkered in their homes and looking at protests and don't recognize or don't know who these people are. 
you know, they're, they're holding back on money that they spend because they don't know when this is going to end. They're not going to work in some cases. And, and it, is a, it is a viable option because, in a way, the Egyptian government is outlining what it will do. The protesters are not. Now, that said, I think people are astonished by what the protesters accomplished, and they're, they're hopeful about what, what, what lies ahead. But there's the immediate problem of, of not knowing what's next. And at least there's the promise of, of stability. Well, I was talking today to someone, and I said, but what if Suleiman says in September or August, whenever they hold the elections, I won, despite all evidence otherwise, what makes you think he'll leave? And, and, and she said, he has to leave, given everything that's happened. Like, there, there's a belief that, that there is power now in the masses and, the, and in the streets, so that um, if the government gets out of control, that they can, they can rein them back in by taking back to the streets. There's a renewed sense of, um, of power in the people. Now, how much of that is real and how much of that is just out of fear of living under this for the last 10 days, it's hard to know, particularly from here. But I think those, that's what the, the, the government is able to exploit. Well, what do you think, uh, we keep hearing from our people there, tomorrow's going to be the big day. What, what happens tomorrow? Well, remember what happened last Friday. You know, we were talking earlier about the internet and the, and the impact it has. Now, last Friday when those protests got together, there was no internet. It had been shut down. You have people going to, to mosques, listening to their imams, gathering together, and potentially going out in the street in, in, the, in as big numbers that, as they can to, to essentially say, if you're one of the protesters, Mubarak, you need to step down by now, and what you've offered is not enough. It's not enough for you to say, I'm going to be here until September. We want immediate change. And the question becomes um, what kind of pushback they'll get from, from pro Mubarak supporters, either those sent out by the government or on their own, and, and what happens, presumably, when the Mubarak presidency does not end tomorrow. How, how, does, that, how does it go from there? What we're really seeing tomorrow is, is it's another sort of metric in terms of whether this is the revolt or re revolution, whether people are saying we have confidence that things can move towards some reform or it, the reform cannot happen until, the, until Hosni Mubarak is no longer the president of Egypt. How has the, uh, as someone looking at this from a foreign perspective, uh, how has uh, the United States handled this? And I mean, I think we all know what the stakes are here. What is at stake? But how, how do you judge the way the administration has handled it? Well, the first thing I would like to say is that if your audience have come to this session feeling happy and optimistic, my purview is to depress them. <laughs> um, As an the, academic who is representative of Al Jazeera. Uh, uh, and <laughs> you get a double whammy. <laughs> the, let me just backpedal a little bit and go, go back to sure. Tunisia. The impression that has stuck to most people's minds about the reaction of the United States to what happened in Tunisia was that it came too late, for whatever reason. We obviously had Secretary of State Hillary Clinton visiting the Gulf just a few days before the former president of Tunisia fled, and she did address in some stark terms, the situation in the, in the Middle East, she was addressing the leaders and telling them about the youth and the conditions of uh, uh, their daily existence and that they had to take some drastic measures to improve that. But she also said, talking about the, the, the riots going on in, in Tunisia, the riots, the uprising, the revolution, whichever way you want to call it, she said, we do not take sides. And obviously, seen from DC, uh, you can understand why she said that. But seen from the region, um, a lot of people uh, took it as a slap in the face uh, because two years ago, when the youth in Iran were going through their turmoil, the government of the United States was much more forceful in endorsing what they were doing. Um, the if you go back with memory to the collapse of the former Soviet bloc, again, the, the position of the, of the United States government was much, much clearer and, and to, to the point, this is what we want to happen. That didn't seem to happen in the eyes of people in the Arab world in Tunisia. And certainly, 
because of the complexity and the consequence of Egypt, which is obviously much bigger than, than Tunisia, a lot of people uh, uh, perceive the United States to have been very tentative in the way that it has handled the Egyptian potato um, in terms of, yes, we support the protesters' rights, but at the same time, I think what a lot of people in the Arab world were clamoring for, and again, if you see it from Washington, you understand why the Obama administration was not putting it in those terms, but what the people in, in the region were clamoring for is a clear cut we want Mubarak to go before it's too late. Now, the way I see it is that it obviously has repercussions for the future role and influence of the United States in that region. And I, I don't want to go too long. I just want to say that whatever the outcome is, I don't think there's a good outcome 100% uh, for the United States in, in the region. I'm not even sure at this particular point in time that there is a good outcome for the Egyptians and for the wider Arab world. Let's watch tomorrow. If it passes off relatively peacefully, uh, then that would obviously reduce uh, the, the, the risks down the road. But if it, if it goes down as a, as a bloody event, whether by Baltajia, as, they, as the, these elements have been attacking the, the protesters over the last 24 hours, or more dangerously by the army that suddenly decides to actually kill civilians, I think you're talking about something much more, much, much more unscalable. Uh, Nancy, uh, why has there no uh, particular person emerged? I mean, we've seen several people uh, come to the but, but right now there's no way to sort of handicap who, if they did have an election, <laughs> Uh, who who the uh, people would be. Is there anyone that has a lot of popular support? Or? Well, M Mubarak designed it that way. He crushed opposition. He, he pitted them against one another, he, and he did it within his own government and within his, within his own army. He ensured that there wasn't a threat to his regime um, or a natural successor than, other than his son as a means to protect power. And so that's why you're seeing, when we, when we talk about what next, we, we, we he can frame the, the debate in some ways as a choice between civility and chaos because it's such a, it's such a vast um, scale of unknowns that going forward. The most notable place that you, you would think the, um, a leader would come from would be from the army. As every, every leader of, uh, of Egypt since, since its independence has come from the army. But if you're a general in the army, you were promoted because you either tacitly or explicitly supported the, the Mubarak regime. Um, and so, you know, historically I, I find myself thinking, is there a colonel in that army, that mid-ranking soldier between those conscript um, rank and file soldiers and the generals who could maybe rise up? We, we've never heard that name yet, and, I, and I, I have to believe that he's put a quash on that. But Gamal Abdel Nasser, of course, Egypt's first president, was a colonel. So I find myself thinking maybe that's where that person will come from. You'll hear a lot of people talking about Mohammed al Bar today as a possible um, leader, at least at the minimum, a transition leader. I think he's more popular outside of Egypt than he is within. He's seen as a, an outsider um, and a secularist more so than most people would want. And, and I haven't found anyone, any middle class Egyptian who sees him as, as sort of the, the vision, the, 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 the embodiment of, of a revolutionary figure. Well, well, John, do you think it is possible to have an orderly transition that we're talking about here? I mean, uh, do you think Mubarak has to go for that to happen? And if he does go, can an orderly transition take place? Well, I, I hate to, to make prognostications where <clears throat> somebody's actually going to read the transcript, but I'm going to do it. And, and I'm, I'm not sure he's going to go. I, I've spoken to people, people I have tremendous respect for, who say there's no way he can stay. And, and I've come to the, to the conclusion that, that I think there he may can. be a way he can stay. And, and what we'll have is a transition that will be precisely the transition that, and perhaps even more orderly a transition than had Mubarak died suddenly in office without these events. People are playing for keeps. The military is focused on maintaining the strong role as both a, an actor and a guarantor of the political system. And I think people are looking at the next six to nine months 
as how do we have an orderly transition which sustains the status quo, makes it indeed more sustainable than it has been. And the other part of this that we haven't talked about is all the other Arab leaders would be absolutely delighted if Hassan Mubarak pulls this out. Because the, the implications of Hassan Mubarak's failure in this are tremendous because then you not only have Tunisia, which is not strategically important to most countries in the neighborhood, but to Egypt, which is strategically important to everybody. And then suddenly, you start having people being terrified of a domino effect. If Hassan Mubarak is able to co-opt this movement, control the movement, emerge with Omar Suleiman and, and, and uh, General Shafiq as the, the paternal figures guarding and protecting the nation and the national interest, then I think we are right back to a much more comfortable status quo for every single Arab government. So how does he stay, if, if you think it is possible for him to stay? I mean, well, I, say, I think that the, the goal is to emerge as the arbiter between these, these street thugs who are throwing uh, uh, Molotov cocktails and rocks and everything else, and the protesters, and, and say, OK, we have a process. We've heard you. We're going to mediate this. We're, we're going to have this committee meeting and that committee's meeting. We're talking about this provision of the Constitution. You, know, you have to talk about the Constitution, because it's going to be legal and orderly. And you just sort of you, 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 drive, you drive it into process. And the process is, of course, controlled by a parliament, which was essentially handpicked by the ruling party, and, and uh, former generals who have precisely an interest in maintaining the current system for a long time to come. Would you, do you agree with that? Uh, to a certain, uh, a certain extent, let me just uh, quickly tangentially say something about uh, Tunisia. John reminded me of it. <clears throat> Tunisia is strategically unimportant, as John said. But remember some extremely big things, and I'm doing a, a quick uh, a history flashback here, some extremely big things in the history of the region came out of Tunisia. Uh, you're uh, uh, Egyptian, so you would know this. If you go to Egypt and you say Il Mu'izz li din Allah, for example, a lot of people are proud of Mu'izz as, 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 a, as, a, as a leader from the, the 10th century who is such an icon of Egyptian history. He is from a dynasty that actually started off in Tunisia and had its eyes on expanding its influence throughout the region, so they decided to actually transfer to Cairo. And that's how Cairo came into being and was built. And th this region is very history focused, if not history obsessed. So that, that's, that's one thing. The second thing I would say is that I feel that even if he were to leave, and, I, I, and I'm of your mind as well, I, I don't think that he's, he's ready to leave anytime soon. Although when Saddam Hussein was introduced by your colleague Dan Rather before the invasion of Iraq in 2003, and he asked him the same thing, he said, would you consider leaving Iraq? And what did Saddam say? He said, why should I leave Iraq? I'm Iraqi and I expect to die in Iraq. Hosni Mubarak said the same thing in his speech yesterday. The only difference is that for Saddam, the ultimatum to leave Iraq at that time was coming from the Americans. For Hosni Mubarak, this time, it's actually coming from Egyptians. Now, let's assume that all that is by the by and that he left. I do not necessarily see the departure of Hosni Mubarak from Egypt as the end of the story by any uh, stretch of the imagination. Again, Tunisia is a good case in point because we saw the president flee, but to this day, some of the remnants of the old regime continue to hold on to power, and, and their argument, which is maybe a good argument, depending on who you talk to, is that we are still holding the country together and without us, the country would disintegrate in all sorts of ways, some of them internal, some others external. Well, I mean, is it kind of the sense of the panel here, and I find this all very interesting, that perhaps the best thing that could happen is if that somehow or another Mubarak could kind of quiet down this protest, and he's now announced he's going to leave and then sort of stay in office until elections could be held? I don't think that's the, the crucial 
point. I think the crucial point is, is are you going to be genuine about changing the nature of a system, which has been a remarkably closed system? Mm -hmm. But I, I, mean, I guess, John, what I'm getting at, is there a better chance to do that if he stays than if he leaves? I think the system is bigger than Hassan Mubarak. Do you? I mean, Hassan Mubarak leads the system as the figurehead, and he's the, the, the focal point. But I think the system is much deeper, it's much broader, and it's much harder to penetrate. Um, I don't, I mean, in some ways, it, it's like a, a country with a king versus a president. Sometimes it's easier when you have a king because a, a king isn't a contestant, and a king can, can sometimes bend the rules, be a, a sort of crooked referee in order to keep everybody playing on the same playing field. To that extent, maybe on a marginal side, if Hassan Mubarak were, were genuinely interested in playing that role, he could play. I don't think he is interested in playing that role. I think he's interested in, in the durability of the existing system. And I don't think the durability of the system matters whether Hassan Mubarak is there or not, except for the fact that if there were a widespread perception that the mob had run Hassan Mubarak out of office, that the remaining elements of the system would feel besieged, and would be less charitable. That's not to say it's, it's good that Hasan Mubarak is there. <clears throat> but I think that this, the, the way it keeps being phrased, as Nancy eloquently said, it's always between the, 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 the Hasan Mubarak and chaos. There's no alternative Hasan Mubarak but chaos. The most dangerous job in Egypt was to be the second most powerful person in the country. Right? Can I, can and, I? and so that, that's sort of where we are. And there's, there's no bench. This is a country, there is no bench. There aren't charismatic leaders, there aren't ministers who are widely perceived to have done a good job. There's nobody with popular backing except for the president because he's had this huge warning track around himself and people who got close to the warning track had to find other jobs. Uh, Nancy, what choices does the uh, Egyptian military face now in the coming months? I mean. Uh, what could be difficult? What could uh, get easier? You know, in a way, they're in an unenviable position because it's interesting. You can actually make a lot of comparisons to their military as to ours in the sense of their responsibility and how they see their responsibility. I, I think, first and foremost, there is a unifying thread in the Egyptian military, which is they see themselves as the defenders of the Egyptian state. And, and at this point, they're, and they answer to their leader. Their leader right now is Hosni Mubarak, and so they are carrying out orders um, from him. And the, and the order right now is to not shoot on demonstrators. It's not their job to shoot on demonstrators. And I think they understand that sh if they did, it would lead to instability in the state. Therefore, the only time that, that I think they need to cross that line is if the state itself collapses, if the, if the system as we now know it somehow collapses and it becomes their job to intervene. But at the same time, for everyday Egyptians, it's quite frustrating to many of them to see the violence breaking out. I, I personally felt this yesterday as you're watching this violence break out yesterday and the military not get involved. You see the tanks on the street, you, and you see the firebombs breaking out and whatnot. And here is the Egyptian army doing its job defending the institutions of, of the Egyptian state, the Egyptian museum, its artifacts, its history. It's defending the institutions and watching these, these violent protests carry out. And so they're walking a very, very thread thin line. And they're doing it um, because that's the job of a military. And that's the job of our military as much as it is of their military. It's not their job to be um, an, an arm of, of Mubarak, but, but an extension of the state. And, and they've really won the respect of the, they already had it, of course, before all this. But they've really won it um, throughout. I always think of it this way. The police are an extension of Mubarak, but the army is the extension of Egypt. And so um, that's why you see the frustration in the people with, with the police. Uh, funny enough, when the police came out today, there were people saying, where, you know, you cowards, where were you? Because they'd run away for a few days. But the Egyptian army stayed. So I, I think they're walking that line quite <laughs> remarkably and consistently since this began. Uh, I'm going to just ask all three of you, and I can just start with you, Nancy. Uh, Talk about the, the effect that this, or the impact that this is, could have on, on the rest of the region. I mean, we know about what happened in Jordan, and we know there's trouble in Yemen. What are the, what are the real danger points, and, and kind of where do you see this going across the region? You know, it affects all of the region. And in, you, know, in, I, you know, Tunisia really broke down that barricade of fear 
of, 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 of the government because it was so astonishing and it happened so quickly and, and, and the dominoes started to fall. And, and, and if you think of this as a big vat of oil, that was the spark, uh, the, the match that kind of got thrown in. And in Syria, I think it'll be a little bit more difficult because they're certainly not as um, open um, relative to other states. I think the Assad regime would come down quickly on, on, on protesters. We'll, we'll see this day of rage is now scheduled, I believe, for February 12th. In Yemen, I think they're a little bit more split about what they want. It's not as clear cut or as it's been made to be in Egypt. There are some people who just want President Saleh to say that he and his son are not going to run in 2013, which, which, um, which they've done. There are some who say he needs to step down right away. And there are still others who say economic reform would be acceptable. So it's a little bit more split. In Jordan, because it's a monarchy, there's a, that division right between the Hashemite kingdom and the government. I, we haven't heard people say they want the end of the Hashemite kingdom, but they wouldn't have the option to say that anyway, because you're not allowed to criticize the government in Jordan. So we saw King Abdullah try to get ahead of it by firing a very unpopular prime minister. And so each country is touched by this, but the inner machinations of them are all different. And so I think you'll start to see um, countries that haven't been directly hit by this um, try to outmaneuver and get ahead of the protest to, to salvage the system as they know it and as they're benefiting from it. And, 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 and other countries are now trying to adjust to, to, what, to what their populations are asking for. I want to hear the other two panelists uh, give their views on that. And, but while they're doing that, uh, those of you who want to ask some questions, uh, be thinking of the questions you want to ask. But let's hear. I, th I think it, it's nobody's secret that uh, the, in the countries of the region, some countries are uh, less stable than others. Yemen springs to mind as one of the least stable uh, uh, countries in the, in the region. I do not, however, believe that the domino effect is inevitable. But the condition is speed. The speed of change in Egypt uh, may avert the risk of the domino effect. And I think several of these leaderships in these countries are, are beginning to ripen up for change. And I think if the change happens in Egypt in a way that safeguards the interests and aspirations of the Egyptian people who have been clamoring for it this, this past week, and at the same time safeguard the, uh, Egypt's, some of Egypt's international commitments, whether with regard to Israel or, or others, I think the government in Egypt would, have, would be under less pressure uh, to introduce some of the genuine internal changes that the people of uh, uh, Egypt want. If that happens in a relatively short period of time, I think other governments in the, the region may have um, an opportunity to do some of the adjustments that their own people uh, uh, are clamoring for, although some of those adjustments could actually be quite bitter as, as, a, as a pill. But I do not believe that the domino effect is necessarily inevitable. John? Let me just underline a couple of things you said. First, I think the speed is, is remarkable. The fact is we've never seen a popular revolution in the history of the Arab world. We may have seen two happen in January, depending on how this comes out. The fact that, that you can have something happen so quickly, it's a combination of the Al Jazeera effect and the Twitter effect, that is television and instant messaging, computer social networking, I think working together in a profoundly interconnected way that changes things. I am less optimistic <clears throat> that this leads us to, to really positive reform. Uh, we all saw the, the courage that Congress showed uh, dealing with our budget problems by get, extending tax, tax cuts and, and, and all those sorts of things. I think the fact is that governments under threat are not going to want to swallow bitter pills. They're going to want to solve. They're going to want to restore uh, uh, subsidies, especially at a time when, when global uh, uh, commodity prices are rising. I worry that, that, that the effect is going to be more government control of communication and more government subsidies. And I say, rather than moving forward to the, the kind of Middle East we thought we were moving toward, I wonder if we're going to be moving back to 1994, 1995, not really in the, in the positive direction at all. You know, I, the one 
uh, country out there we haven't talked about is Israel, which is obviously watching this. Uh, I think it was underlined to me just how serious Israel views this when uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, asked the ministers in his government not to comment. And it's been a long time since I've heard an, an Israeli Prime Minister. A long time since his ministers listened to him. Uh, since they've listened, or one who would think he could actually tell them not to, not to be quiet, or to be quiet. And, but they have been. Uh, how, how, how serious is this for Israel? And then we'll go to questions. Israel's terrified. I mean, Israel's terrified of a Muslim Brotherhood-led Egypt. Israel is terrified of any sort of leadership change because the fact is that Israel has become quite comfortable with Hosni Mubarak. Uh, they're uncomfortable with more populist politics in Egypt because the, the Israeli-Egyptian agreement is deeply unpopular in Egypt. Um, Israel feels that, that they have all the understandings they need with the current system in Egypt, and any change to that system uh, is deeply... Let me just ask you this. If, if Mubarak does go, do you think the uh, Camp David Accords, the thing that's been in force here for 30 years now, is that out the window, yeah, or I think can the, it survive? I think the Israelis have better understandings with Omar Suleiman than they do with Hassan Mubarak, and they have excellent understandings with Hassan Mubarak. I mean, Omar Suleiman has been doing an incredible amount of lifting with the Israelis on Hamas, on Gaza, on a whole range of issues. They're very comfortable with Omar Suleiman. When you start talking about bringing in other players and, and broader politics in Egypt, that's when the Israelis get extremely concerned because that leads you away from the kinds of very pragmatic understandings that the current government of Egypt's reached. I, I think that... As, as long as the army remains the backbone of power, which, as Nancy said a little while ago, which is the very likely outcome anyway, uh, although I would argue that uh, for many Egyptians, fortunately, the army is the instrument of the state, but unfortunately, it's also the instrument of the regime. But that's, that's a different question. But whether it's an instrument, whether you look at it as an instrument of the state or of the regime, I think any government that takes over uh, in, in the future in, in Egypt would not want to open that front with Israel by abrogating the uh, um, Camp David uh, Accord, the peace treaty with Israel. For one thing, the army would not go for it. Um, so I think on, on, on that front, uh, I'm, I'm not so... I'm not so sure that the, 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 the Egyptians would go down that route. Where I do think they would make a change, the new government in Egypt would make a change, is in the relationship between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Yeah, the Egyptians have obviously been mediating between the two. Remember that Egypt has always carried the mantle of Arab nationalism. And the Palestinian issue continues to be a very strong uh, um, nationalistic rallying cry for the Arabs. So the government in Egypt will want to reassume that mantle because in the eyes of many Arabs it, it actually stopped wearing it. So it will want to assume it and it will be very important for its legitimacy throughout the Arab world to actually change course in how it mediates between the Israelis and the Palestinians. In other words, Israel, I don't think um, at least as far as I can see now, it would not necessarily have to worry about a peace treaty. But the issue of settlement, I think, that would be an yes, that would be And Gaza issue. security. Yes, yeah, the, the, the Palestinian issue yeah. in all its flanks. Just one quick thing. I, I often hear comparisons between this and what happened in Iran. And remember, Egypt needs a relationship with the Western world. Iran didn't. Iran had oil. Egypt needs the Western world for the Suez Canal, for, uh, for tourism, for... U.S. aid for um, cotton exportation. That's Egypt's economy. That It depends on a relationship with the Western world. And so it doesn't have the option economically to, to um, anger um, the Western world. And so it's going to have to balance sort of carrying that, that title of, of, of the representative of Arab nationalism while sustaining itself economically. That's a very good point. All right. I promised we'd go. Uh, this gentleman here. And could you go to the mic? Because it's on C-SPAN. Thank you. Is this on? 
Yes. Yeah. Uh, my name is Joe Dukert. I'm an energy analyst and a senior associate uh, with CSIS. Uh, I don't know where physically President Mubarak is. Obviously, Christian Amanpour does. Uh, <laughs> but I, I can't understand why the protesters have not uh, used the classic protest tactic of surrounding him wherever he is. Could Who you wants comment? to take a? I'll start. Um, I was actually wondering that myself. I thought he was in Sharm el-Sheikh. That, but, but then Christiane Amanpour said that she interviewed him at a presidential palace. I don't know if that, because he was spending more time in Sharm el-Sheikh. Now, Sharm el-Sheikh is advantageous to him because most Egyptians can't get there. They can't afford it. And actually, Sharm is closed off to Egyptians other than those who work there. And so that would be the most protected place he could be. The presidential palace, though, is also a protected area. So it's not as, as easy to sort of storm the palace, if you will. The other thing is that they, as, as John talked about earlier, it's, it's an information war as well, and the cameras and the attention is focused on Tahir Square. It has been cast as the battleground in terms of um, who, who's representing the, the voice of, of, of Egypt. And so I think all those, those factors are in play. I don't know anyone who's identified precisely where he is. The, the first I heard was Christiane Amanpour say a presidential palace. I took that to be Cairo, but I, I couldn't tell you for sure. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Enjoy the presentations. Uh, I hear, of course, this uh, sort of uh, conservative. By the way, my name is Paolo von Schirach, Schirach Report. The sort of uh, skeptical approach regarding the possibility of this indeed becoming a revolution as opposed to a revolt. And, in, and uh, you, Dr. Altman, indicate that it may actually go back some to the extent that. Uh, uh, President Mubarak can position himself as the broker between the, the revolutionaries and the counter-revolutionaries, if you wish. If you could perhaps elaborate a little more on the role of the United States, which was touched upon earlier on. President Obama has said, for whatever is worth, the transition has to start now. And uh, watching yesterday the State Department briefing, uh, the State Department indicated that there has to be a process, it has to be inclusive, it has to be participatory, it has to be transparent, and we're going to watch it, and, and, and so far it has not progressed to the level that we would like to see. Now, are these just generic uh, exhortations, uh, sort of to, to satisfy world opinion in a generic sense, or, are, or is there something behind this idea of the transition has to start now or else, or if it doesn't start now in a satisfactory manner, what is a satisfactory manner? And last point, obviously, uh, the United States uh, uh, provides uh, Egypt with uh, enormous amount of resources. I believe Egypt is the second largest recipient of military and civilian aid. I've personally visited USAID Cairo, which is a, a city uh, in the outskirts of the city. So is there any leverage, or is this an essentially something that the United States is watching, hoping for the best? And again, what does transition has to start now mean in a practical sense? John, Thank why you. don't you? I mean, the, the Egyptians would argue that it started, right? I mean, Omar Suleiman gave a speech, and he talked about all the committees they're going to form, and all our timelines are. And, and you know, I think one of the instructive things is to look at the Egyptian response to the, the Bush Freedom Agenda, which was to have a big conference in Alexandria and talk about how the, the, the American freedom agenda was, in fact, an authentically Egyptian agenda, and they were going to run it. And you saw how many times the Alexandria Conference continued to meet and how many times the committees did everything else. I mean, the fact is that, that what the Egyptians will seek to do is institutionalize precisely what the Americans are talking about and then run those institutions. And one of the problems you have from the U.S. government side is you can assign people from the embassy to try to work with people and follow what the committees are doing and everything else, but for People in the United States, this is an avocation. This is one of many things they do for people in the White House. It's one of many things they do. They have other things going on. And for the Egyptians, this is for the whole ball of wax. This is it. This is the game. This determines what the next 50 years look like. And when that's the stakes, and the Americans are trying to do a whole range of things, I think it's very hard for the Americans to have a lot of influence over the shape of the process. That being said, I think there is no question the shape of the U.S.-Egyptian relationship going forward will change as a consequence of this. It has gone along for 30 years, and I think, quite frankly, it's been running on fumes. That we have a relationship which, because it's been so much aid for so long, 
that there's been a mutual resentment between both sides. Each side feels taken for granted by the other. And what this is doing is it's forcing both sides to think about what they want the US-Egyptian relationship to be. I don't think that's all unhealthy. But part of that will mean that <laughs> Egypt will not be as central to US thinking as it's been. And how central it is partly depends on how the Egyptians behave during this process. But we are certainly witnessing a change in this relationship. It's a relationship which President Mubarak inherited from Anwar Sadat when he became president in 1981. It's a relationship which President Mubarak has not reinvigorated. He sought not to reinvigorate it. He sought to keep it the same way and sustain it. And because of what is happening, this is a relationship that will be redefined, refocused over the next several years. And the way that happens will be very much in the shadow of what happens in terms of the demonstrations, in terms of the demands, in terms of the succession to President Mubarak. Just want to quickly say two things, if I may. I mean, the way I see it is that uh, uh, President Mubarak has two different clocks when he hears Obama, President Obama, talking about we want change now. One clock is pointing to yesterday, which is, as John said, uh, he's thinking, I I've already introduced uh, some of those changes that you asked me to do. The other one is pointing at tomorrow because he still feels that he has cards he can still play. And if he's going to climb down, the climb down is going to be incremental. And it isn't over until it's over, uh, whatever shape or form that over finally takes. Just one quick uh, thing I want to say about the aid. I think the aid in the eyes of uh, the Americans is one thing. The aid in the eyes of the Egyptians is a, is a, is a different thing. In other words, aid has been part of the solution, but also part of the problem. Yes, the United States has invested uh, a lot of money in military-to-military -military cooperation with Egypt. But the way Egyptians see it, remember Egypt, it's 5,000 years of history, 80 million, 80 million people, crucial to anything that happens not just in the region, but in the, the rest of the world in terms of security and stability. How much does it get? less than $2 billion a year. I'm not saying that the, United, the expectation is that the United States should, should match up what it gives to Israel, because we know that's, that's just not going to happen. But a lot of Egyptians see it as more as an affront to uh, some sort of uh, 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 humil uh, is an affront to their dignity where the, the regime has actually put them. It has put this country where it's actually uh, seeking arms giving from the Americans when in fact it's a major power that should be sustaining itself rather than asking others for money. Right. Question here. Bill DeBaghi with, with Maxim International. Bob, I, um, <clears throat> I was wondering when John quickly said Tunisia's non-strategic of Hannibal and uh, the Carthaginians and what the Romans thought of that area but 2,000 years ago. Uh, my concern now is We've spoken of Jordan. We've spoken of Israel. Uh, we haven't mentioned Lebanon. But uh, the, it, to my understanding, uh, the U.S. has suffered a great defeat, as has Israel, in the recent developments in Lebanon. Could you speak to that and how that sort of uh, touches all the, the larger bases we've been discussing? I mean, to, Good to, point. To pick up on Abdelrahim's point, the fact is that how this plays out in all these different countries is very, very different. I think how it plays out in a country like Jordan, which is divided between East Bank Jordanians who serve in the army, who serve in the government, uh, who feel that Jordan is their only home, to Palestinian Jordanians, West Bank Jordanians, who the East Bankers say are not really genuine Jordanians. We just were nice and we gave them citizenship. And I'm afraid that, that were you to have uprisings in, in Jordan, it would quickly turn into a civil war. It would be Jordanians fighting Jordanians instead of a united front appealing to the government. So that's the Jordan. In, in Yemen, you have different interest groups. And I think that Yemeni politics have largely been about interest groups making demands on the central government. That's a different dynamic. In Lebanon, you have 18 different sects who are all officially recognized, who all have their own politics. I think the way it works in Lebanon is... is I'm talking about the strength of Hezbollah, which uh, is no, I, dominant. But Hezbollah can, can have influence in politics because they've made a deal with the Druze. 
they've made a deal with a faction of the Christians. I mean, the fact is that I think with all of these countries, the, the manifestations are different. I think what we've seen, as Abdel Rahim was saying, that the speed of this, the unpredictability, makes everybody less comfortable because of a sense that people thought they knew the game and the sense that maybe they don't know the game, that Tunisia can collapse essentially, in a, I mean, it, it rose to a presidential level, and within a week, the president was on a plane out of the country. I mean, what, as I, I am not ashamed to say that, that on Thursday of that week, I said, people are talking about Ben Ali leaving. I mean, what's the rush? I don't get it. What, I mean, why are people jumping to a conclusion? And the next day, he's on a plane out of the country. The, the unpredictability, I think, helps shape it, but the manifestation in each country is both unpredictable, but also shaped by the specific conditions in that country, which are very different from country to country. Let me, uh, there one final question here, and uh, because our time is running out, but let me ask each of you, and I'll, just, I'll start with you, doctor. What is a successful outcome here, and when we, will we know it when we see it? Pass. <laughs> <laughs> Can I come back on Saturday, at least? <laughs> Tomorrow is a big day, right? Yes. Very cool. It's, 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 a, it's a big day. And I think um, a big part of uh, the answer to the question hinges on what happens uh, uh, tomorrow. I mean, what, one, the ideal scenario is that it would pass off uh, peacefully. Uh, the, the expectation after what we've seen in the last 24 hours is that it's not going to happen, it's not going to pass off peacefully. Uh, we may see some uh, more clashes among uh, Egyptians. But the, the, other, the other two scenarios that I see is that either the army intervenes and puts down the revolution, uprising, whatever you want to call it, bloodily. Um, and I think that would launch Egypt down the long and painful uh, pathway of, of chaos for a long time and the region with it. Or, and I want to quickly go back to what John said earlier, the army does manage to uh, control the situation in, in one way or another, but the temptation for it to take Egypt back not just uh, two months, but many, many, many years, that temptation will be, will be on. I think my, my sense is that the Arab world will not go back to where it was two months ago. And I, I, that's, not a judgment, that's not a judgment of value. I'm not saying the, Arab, the, the prospects are very good. Good or bad, there's no going back to where the Arab world was, was two months ago. Nancy, just some closing thoughts here. Well, I'm, gonna, I'm feeling ambitious, so I'm going to try to tackle that first question. And I come from it as a per, from a personal perspective. The successful outcome to me is in Egypt where you don't have well-educated men, smart men, um, s graduating college in their 20s and staring at a lifetime of hopelessness. You've had a whole generation do that. I think one of the reasons you're seeing the, these men come up and take to the streets is they're, they've seen their fathers do it and they don't want to do the same. It's, it's what um, the prospect of that is what brought my father here. It's what I see in so many of my relatives going forward. So I don't know what the outcome is strategically or politically, but my hope and, and the best outcome for me is that, is that Egypt that offers, offers those youth something other than a lifetime of, of hopelessness. John. I, I agree with Nancy. I think the, the, the good outcome is one that leads to a genuine uh, incorporation of more people into a political process that improves outcomes, that gives people a sense that they're vested in the society uh, and creates a more resilient country. And, and my fear uh, is that the country may be on the brink of heading in the opposite direction. I hope with all my heart that's not true. Do you believe that tomorrow is the, is the crucial day? Um, I think tomorrow could be crucial if it were extremely violent. Uh, it could be crucial if it were extremely massive and disciplined. It could be crucial. My own guess is we won't really know how this is going for another two months, that there is going to be some sort of ongoing process. And at some point, people will say, is this process at all genuine, or is it a, a complete fraud? And, and you know, it will be hard to recapture the momentum of the days. But I think there's bitterness. The worst outcome, clearly, 
is that you have a, a sustained period of conflict that leads to polarization, radicalization. I think that's what leads us to extremely negative outcomes, uh, either a, a, a very uh, hardline secular military-led government or a hardline religious-led government. I think that's certainly one of the things the government, the U.S. government, has been saying all along. We're trying to avoid. All right. Well, on behalf of uh, TCU and the Schieffer School of Journalism and CSIS, thank you all for coming.